Our Gospel reading for this morning comes from that section of John's Gospel, a very extended section, sometimes referred to as the Farewell Discourses, uh, where Jesus is speaking to the disciples on the night of his arrest. John's Gospel describes that evening quite differently than the other three Gospels. There's no uh, Last Supper, but there is the foot washing that most of us are familiar with, which is not in the other Gospels. And Jesus gives long and lengthy instructions about what will happen when he is gone. Uh, Chapter 17, which we don't get to today, is almost entirely a prayer for the disciples. Um, Prior to that, though, we, we have the instructions. And today's readings are selected verses from chapters 14, 15, and 16, where Jesus is speaking of the ministry of the disciples to come and the Spirit that will be with them to help them. Listen for what the Spirit may speak to us today through these words. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. And skipping over to verse 25, I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. And then moving again to the 26th verse of chapter 15. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify on my behalf, because you have been with me from the beginning. And then finally moving over to 16.7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin because they do not believe in me. About righteousness because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer. About judgment because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Christian faith has uh, its share of pithy sayings and proverbs that can be pulled out on particular occasions. Uh, They're a mixed bag. Some of them are pretty good restatements of certain aspects of the Christian faith, and some of them are bad distortions of it. Some of these distortions, for some reason, have taken on quasi-biblical status. Many people, for example, think that God helps those who help themselves is in the Bible somewhere. Most of you know it's uh, actually from Poor Richard's Almanac by Benjamin Franklin, although Franklin didn't originate the saying. And the saying itself is also contradicted by rather large swaths of Scripture. One of my least favorite of these pithy sayings is one that you've surely heard, God never gives you more than you can handle. I'm sure that people who have taken comfort of that, otherwise it wouldn't be around, but 
I know for certain that it can inflict real pain on people who are already suffering by telling them that 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 experience that is excruciating and leaving them broken and shattered is nothing more than they can handle. I've always wondered what Jesus would have said if someone had comforted him with this saying when he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There's another one of these little sayings that gets trotted out when churches are in recruitment mode. Um, someone being looked for to coordinate vacation Bible school or teach a class or uh, perhaps be a leadership, uh, some leadership position in the church. And they're asked and they say, well, I don't really know that I have the gifts or the abilities that needed for, for this position. And the recruiter responds with, God doesn't call the equipped. God equips the called. Now, if you're not familiar with that one, you may want to write it down. Um, <laughs> it's, it's quite a good one. Uh, God doesn't call the equipped. God equips the called. Um, it is quite handy. It, it, it comes in really good when someone's on the fence. They're, they're thinking about maybe doing it, but not sure they have what it takes. Um, and, and while it can be misused, it does have the advantage of being pretty much true and also being biblical. That's, in some manner, what our scripture is about this morning. Jesus is promising his, his followers that the advocate, the the Spirit will come and be with them and it will provide them all that they need to know. It will teach them all they need. It will guide them in all truth. I mean, think of how wonderful it must have been from a Christian perspective to have been taught by Jesus, to actually have been there with Him. But Jesus says it is better that He leave so that His followers can have the Spirit. They're better off without Him they're better off having God's presence dwelling in them through the Spirit than they were with Jesus actually being there. And so if Jesus is to be believed, then we're really at no disadvantage compared to those first disciples. We can know and experience all that they did through the power of the Spirit. And it's only hinted at in our reading, but other passages in the New Testament make abundantly clear that the Spirit also provides people with abilities to do things they could never have done before, that they couldn't do on their own. The Apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth and says that to each, to every single believer, is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Everyone, in some way, is filled with the Spirit and so able to provide some essential part of us being the body of Christ. These are not the same things, these spiritual gifts, not the same things as talents and natural abilities. They, they are, if you will, supernatural abilities. Now, I realize that term makes people a little squirmy in Presbyterian churches. This supernatural is not a word we throw around a lot in the Presbyterian church uh, for, for a number of reasons. The, the Spirit is sort of the neglected stepchild in the Trinity in mainline churches. We don't pay that much attention to the Spirit. We talk a lot about Jesus, a lot about God. But we've never been quite sure what to do with the Spirit. And even though the spirituality has become very popular in recent years, and that of course means talking about the Spirit, still very often that stays limited to a kind of very personal, intimate sphere, uh, dealing only with my spirituality, and not so much with the larger body of Christ and our work and worship and mission in the world. Many years ago I had a, a conversation with a church leader 
about my desire that the, the session, which for those that don't know is, is our governing council, uh, that our session would be less of a place that discussed and debated and made decisions and more of a place that listened for the movement of the Spirit and tried to hear what God was calling us to do. And as I I spoke to this person, they they got this real befuddled look on her face, and she simply could not understand how the church could do anything other than to discuss and make the best decisions possible. She said, God gave us brains, she said. We're just supposed to use those. Now, I certainly agree with that. We are supposed to use our brains. But I do not think that is all we have as the church. Jesus promises us more. We don't simply have our intellects and some information in the Bible that we try to apply in the best possible way. Jesus says we are going to receive the Spirit, the Advocate, to teach and to guide and to empower us. When I was first called as the pastor here at Paul's Church, uh, I was having a a lunch. My wife, Sean, and I were having a lunch with the pastor nominating committee as things wrapped up. And sometime during that lunch, Bitsy, a, a member of the committee, remarked that one of the good things about the thing, this process coming to a close was that she wouldn't have to hear any more talk about discerning who was called to be the pastor. <laughs> she thought that if she heard the word discern one more time, she would scream. Now, if you've never been closely uh, connected to the Presbyterian search and call process, you may not be able to appreciate um, uh, Bitsy's sort of frustration at this bit of church speak. Uh, discernment is actually a very specific thing that is appropriate to questions such as who is called to be our next pastor. But in practice, it very often becomes nothing more than a churchy way of saying, decide. Discernment is supposed to be about letting the Spirit guide us rather than us doing the deciding. But as a general rule, we've often been so spirit-averse that it really is little more than one more piece of annoying church jargon. Now, I get why it is that we're nervous about the Spirit. I mean, I grew up with that, too. The Those churches that call themselves spirit-filled are those churches that do things like speak in tongues and wave their hands and things we Presbyterians are generally not fond of doing. But the fact is that such stereotypical notions of Pentecostalism are not really at the heart of the charismatic tradition. In those words I quoted from the Apostle Paul a little while ago about each of us having spiritual manifestations, Paul is writing to correct the Corinthian Christians who think that speaking in tongues is the spiritual gift par excellence and that any real Christian should surely be able to do that. Paul actually takes speaking in tongues and demotes it to the very bottom of the list of gifts. And he says that Christ-like love is the greatest gift. But sort of fear of Pentecostal excesses is not the only reason we tend to keep the Spirit at arm's length. I and an awful lot of other Christians get pretty nervous at the thought of giving up control. But the trouble is, I cannot be a follower of Jesus without doing precisely that. I don't know if it's a foolproof formula, 
But a, a good gauge for trying to get some measure of our openness to the Spirit is to ask ourselves where we have done something because of God that we would never have done on our own. Where have you said yes to Jesus when your own intuition and logic said no? Where have we as a congregation, as a committee, as a church council done something that our rationality and our best discussions did not seem to recommend, but that we nonetheless felt God was calling us to do? Where have we given over control to God to the guidance of the Spirit? When Jesus says, when Jesus calls us, he says, follow me. And he proceeds to blaze a trail out to the hurting and the lost and the broken of the world. He shares God's love with the people on the margins. And he's willing to suffer and even to die for others, even others who are his enemies. And he says that the Spirit will come to us and help us to continue to go to those same places. Naturally, that will ask us to go some places we would never have gone on our own, that we might never want to go on our own. But Jesus says that it is in such acts of giving control over to God, to the Spirit, that we discover true life. For those who seek to save their life will lose it, says Jesus. But those who lose their life for my sake will find it. We're not on our own. That's both a wonderful promise that the Spirit dwells in us and leads us into full and abundant life. And it is a call, a call to entrust ourselves to the divine presence that leads us where Jesus is calling, that leads us into the ways of that full and abundant life. Being open to the call of the Spirit, to the guidance of the Spirit, is not something we come to easily or naturally. It's certainly not something we're likely to learn from our prevailing culture, which encourages us to be independent and self-reliant. And so we probably need to learn ways of being more open to the Spirit's presence within us. Some of us may need to learn new spiritual practices, Things such as Lectio Divina or particular methods of discernment, Bitsy. Uh, there are guides for doing particular kinds of discernment. Some of you might want to talk with Diane, our pastor for spiritual growth, about opportunities here at Falls Church Press to, to learn how to be more open to God speaking to us, to God's presence within us, seeking to guide us. I don't know what thing is right for you, but this I do know. The Spirit is eager to guide and teach and equip us as individuals and as a congregation so that we can be and do precisely what God is calling us to be and to do. And that reminds me of one last pithy statement that I think on point for today. Stop asking God to bless what you're doing. Get involved in what God is doing. 
it's already blessed. All praise and glory to the God who sends us the Spirit, the Advocate, the Helper, and who empowers us to be Christ to the world. Thanks be to God.